Acts chapter 9, we're going to look together here. Uh, we're going to continue in this movement of the gospel. Chapters 8 and 9 of Acts have really been about the advancement of the gospel outside of Jerusalem. We see it advance into Judea, into Galilee, into Samaria. We have emphasized how the gospel is for everybody, really for the outcasts, the Samaritans. They were outcasts from the Jewish people and how the gospel went there, or the Ethiopian eunuch and how he was excluded from temple worship, yet the gospel came to him and, and called him in, and, and how they were welcomed in this. And now, even in our passage today, this as Luke had called him, this murderous wild beast of a man, Saul, excluded outside of the gospel, has been brought in. The wolf that goes and seeks to devour the sheep has now been tamed by the lamb himself. And so the Lord, on the road to Damascus, converted, transformed, called this great persecutor of the church to faith. And now we see how the Lord met Saul on the road, that that was only the beginning. That was just the start of what he's going to do with Saul. And so as we continue today, we're going to look at how this continues in this section, starting in verse 10 and going through verse 31 of Acts chapter 9. So if you have your word, uh, follow along with me there, if you will. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And he has not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached the preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this day and opportunity to gather here. Father, thank you for the testimonies we heard from Jonathan, from those parents dedicating those children. God, we pray this is true in every way. Father, we pray that your blessing would continue to be upon our church as we seek to follow after you and every one of us who are present here today, whether we're in this room or watching online, God, I pray that you would help us to feel the comfort of your spirit 
and through feeling that comfort that only can come from you. And as we walk in fear of the Lord, Father, that you would multiply us by your grace and for your glory. We ask all of these things. Amen. As we said last week, Saul's conversion is both like our own conversion, if you're a child of God, and not like it at the same time. And what follows here after it is really the same. What we find here is is some unique circumstances to this case, surely. But what we also see is how the church reacts to Saul becomes a paradigm for how we should react to those who become converted. Or how Saul reacts to his conversion. What happens to him is is a, a way that we should react. What he becomes about also should be what we are about as well. The Lord is still orchestrating everything. As we've talked throughout Acts, the the main character of the text is is the Lord himself. And and here we see that same thing. As the Lord arrested Saul by his grace on the road to Damascus, now the Lord will appear to Ananias, orchestrating everything. This disciple named Ananias is told by the Lord to go and find Saul on straight street. And of course, he balked at this. Surely, who could blame him for saying, you really want me to go to the guy that came here to arrest us? You really want me to go to the guy that was this uh, breathing out threats and murderous accusations against all of us? You really want me to go there? But as we read here in the text, the reputation of Saul was was, was well known. It was widespread. His purpose for coming was understood by everyone as as Ananias simply says he came here to arrest us but then the Lord tells Ananias of something that happened he says to Ananias go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name In this way, Ananias then goes because the Lord has told him to go. And Ananias, this disciple who was well spoken of himself, this leader of the believers in in Damascus, goes for a couple reasons. One, he becomes a symbol of those who might doubt the radical nature of God's grace. He he, he says, is this really true? And and Ananias goes to to prove that it is true. He'll be the declaration to others as as he goes. He's needed because he's got to verify Saul's conversion to the new church there in Damascus, those who believe. And so he goes as one who doubted only to see that God's grace is strong enough, God's grace is great enough to change even the most wicked of sinners, the most murderous of sinners. God's grace can change them. And Ananias becomes that testimony to the church. I've seen it. I've recognized it. And he is going to have to welcome Saul into the other believers. And Ananias goes because he was a follower of Jesus. And the Lord called him to a duty. The Lord says, Ananias, you must go. You are the one I'm choosing to appear before Saul. In fact, the Lord says, I already told him you were coming. And so you must go to carry out this duty before the Lord and how important of a duty this was. I love what verse 17 says. Ananias surely is concerned about this one, not really knowing how this this confrontation is going to be or what's going to happen. Ananias comes in the room and how does he address Saul? Trusting the Lord, believing in the grace of God, believing that he can save anybody. Ananias says, brother Saul. Now imagine the intensity of this moment. This is the man who came to arrest and put to death believers in Damascus. And now Ananias, the leading believer of the city, the leading believer of the town, is coming into the room. He's going to him, having heard the word of the Lord that this one is now converted. He's now mine. You need to go. And Ananias says, Brother Saul, he's no longer an enemy of Ananias or the believers in Damascus. Now he is family. He refers to him as brother. Understand that the intensity of that relationship. We oftentimes throw around brother and sister, and we should. The scripture says we call each other that. But that bears testimony that we are a part of one family now. And trusting the Lord, Ananias goes. And how much did Saul need a brother at this point? He had 
changed radically on the road to Damascus and the very ones he had hated and looked to kill are the ones he needed to embrace him. And the very ones he turned against, the chief priests and others, now they would, they would cast him out for he has become one that, that does not follow after their ways anymore. How important it was for Saul to hear those words from Ananias. Brother Saul, it's the same way for us. How important it is for us to embrace new believers in our life and in our church to embrace those who come to faith, to welcome them in, not as outcasts or strangers, but just like us, ones who've been forgiven by the grace of God, arrested by His glorious grace. How important it is for, uh, it is for us to embrace new b- believers. No matter how badly they have behaved in the past, we welcome them into our family because just like us, they've been saved by grace. They've been radically changed from their sins and forgiven. We believe, as we've said countless times here in the book of Acts, we believe that God can and has forgiven Saul. He can forgive anybody, anywhere, anytime, no matter what dastardly deeds you have done. He can forgive you of your sins, no matter what baggage you may bring in. He can forgive you of all of those things. He is mighty to save. Your sin is not greater than God's grace. He can forgive anyone at any time, anywhere that calls upon his name, and he is ready to do so. He's ready to do so. And just as Jesus forgives anyone who calls upon him and casts their their sins upon him and, and, and turns away from them in repentance and faith, so should we be ready to accept anybody that comes by faith as well into our body. We should be ready to accept anyone who comes. That's 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16 says, By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Here, Ananias becomes a testimony of that. He's ready. As Jesus had laid down his life for him, he's ready to go and lay down his life for Saul. As it continues in 1 John, it says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And here it's not just lip service that Ananias gives to Saul. He goes to him at his greatest point of need and he loves him. He cares for him. He welcomes him in. We see this again, by the way, in our passage. Just to to touch on it here in this theme. As Saul later will go to Jerusalem, verse 26 tells us when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. Now, Saul will tell us in Galatians that it would be some three years before he goes into Jerusalem. So he's been preaching and teaching there in Damascus and other places for some three years. And finally, he gets up the courage to go into Jerusalem. And what happens there? The disciples say, not that guy. Don't want him back. That's too much. So he's spurned having preached and taught in in Damascus, even confounded those who would hear, proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God, proclaiming all that he was the Christ. He's done all of this stuff. He even faced persecution for doing it, having to be lowered out at night so he wouldn't be killed. Having done all of that, still when he goes to Jerusalem, the disciples said, not that guy. We remember when he held the coats when they stoned Stephen. We remember when he breathed out through threats against us in the streets. We remember all of these things. Not that guy. And it tells us all were afraid of him, but how glorious for Saul is verse 27. But Barnabas. The church rejected him. They were scared of him. And maybe we could say rightly so. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement. That's what his name means. But Barnabas. Barnabas goes to Saul at his greatest need here, coming into the faith, trying to to be met here as one who's been changed by the gospel. Barnabas goes to him when no one else would, and he vouches for him. Before all the apostles, before all the disciples, the son of encouragement was an incredible encouragement to Saul. And here in our passage, then Ananias and Barnabas become examples to us of how we welcome in others into our body. 
We don't set them outside. We don't tell them, y'all got to catch up with us. We bring them in faithfully, lovingly, caringly, welcoming them into our church, to our body to say, you are one of us. If Jesus is your Lord, if you've been changed by his gospel, you are one of us. And my prayer is that anyone who would love to come come and join us as, as Christians here at Taylor's First will feel this same encouragement. But Barnabas... But Ananias, they were so good to me. They were so kind to me. And that bears the question for us. Because I believe this is an example. How have you been an encouragement to your fellow brothers and sisters? How have you shown them love and word and deed and encouraged them? We see how Saul was welcomed in and encouraged. Let's every one of us seek when we come together to be an encouragement to one another. Oftentimes we see we have a, 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 people tell me we have a, a church that is growing and we continue to see more and more people and they get scared. They don't want to go up and talk to them because they're afraid they should have known them 10 years ago, right? That's the great fear. Hey, nice to meet you. I get it all the time. I mean, it happens to me constantly and I'm the pastor, so it makes it even worse. Hey, great to meet you. Yeah, I met you. I've been here. In fact, I've been here 40 years. You've been here too. You should, you should know me right? But the greater fear would be that we would not reach out. Not that we would become embarrassed in a simple conversation, but that we would not be an encouragement, that we would not welcome them in, that we would not be a place of love and care for one another so that we can welcome each other into the body. This, my friends, is the true nature of the church. Love one another, the scripture says so that your joy may be full. And I can promise you, having spent my whole life in the church, there's no greater joy I have than to be able to come to the body of Christ and feel the love of Christ. May that be the case for every one of us. Be an Ananias. Be a Barnabas. Love and encourage one another and strengthen one another. In fact, I love it where you go to the end of this passage in verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, really that's all of of Israel as you know it. Up in the top, Galilee, Samaria in the middle, Judea in the south. The church through all of that area was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the fear of the Lord, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and that last two words, it multiplied. I know that loving one another and encouraging one another are at the heart of a church that is at peace and being built up. Loving one another and encouraging one another is at the heart of a church that is strengthened and encouraged. Loving one another and encouraging one another is one of the main reasons the church multiplies. As others see our faith and our love for each other on display, it testifies to the love of Christ. This is a lesson then for us on how the church must react to new believers and to one another. But what about Saul here? We see how the church reacts and we want to emulate that. What what is Saul's reaction? As we see the advancement of the gospel, we, we want to see how does that work in Saul's own life? And here I believe what we see is that immediately Saul develops a healthy routine that should be for every one of us as believers. In other words... This simple breakdown as we go through this is what we all should be doing. Quickly, we just see four things here. First, he's at prayer. The gospel advances in your life. And so as we think of how you can encourage and strengthen one another, now let's think about each one of us. How does the gospel advance in our own heart, in our own life? How do we grow as believers? And I think what we see here is the baseline for that. First, it's through prayer. Whenever the Lord comes to Ananias, He says to Ananias, he calls him, Ananias says, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. He's praying there. And how did the Lord know he was praying? He was praying to him. Y'all know what I'm talking about? He knew Saul was praying because the Lord had heard his prayers. There at the very beginning of his conversion, Saul begins to cry out to Jesus. He's praying. Jesus hears him. And maybe this is how it works all the time. 
Get how this happens. Saul prays, Lord, help me. Lord, teach me. Lord, show me. His eyes are still blinded. Lord, help me. And the Lord looks at Saul and says, hey, I'm going to send a dude named Ananias. He's going to come for you. And the Lord goes over to Ananias and says, hey, guess what? I told Saul you're coming. Get up and go. Maybe, I believe still that's how the Lord works in our own lives. How the Lord speaks to us to go to others, to help out with others, even as we're praying. He says, they need help. Have you ever felt that nudge of the Spirit in your own heart that your brother or your sister needs you? Here the Lord is working it out to say, I'm with you and I'm going to send someone there. Saul is praying. Few things signal the genuineness of conversion better than the desire to pray. Very few things signal the genuineness of Saul's conversion here than the fact that he's on his knees praying. You don't have to teach it. You don't have to teach a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to pray. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? I know you say, Josh, the Lord taught him there in the scriptures, all this other stuff. But what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is when you meet Jesus face to face, when you come to understand he is Savior and Lord, and you have been saved only by his grace, you don't need someone to tell you that it must come, that you call out to his name regularly and always. Surely your prayers need to be shaped, maybe. Maybe you can be taught from the scriptures what they look like and, and understand how to do them better. But at the moment you come to faith is the moment you cry out to Christ. You cry out to the Lord. It's like breathing. Saul on the road to Damascus had a new heart. He'd become a, a new creation. And the very testimony that he was a new creation with a new heart is that he was breathing out the breath that Christians breathe, which is prayer. Just as we don't have to teach our babies to to breathe. They know it. So we don't have to teach believers to pray. We know it. Pray always, the scripture tells us. Pray about everything, the scripture tells us. In fact, pray always, pray about everything, and ask anything. On three occasions in John's gospel, the Lord says, ask anything of me and I will give it to you. Ask anything in my name and it will be yours. The question here for us as we grow is, are we praying? Is that, a, is that a sign for us? Are we spending regular time every day in prayer? But even more than that, do we keep the conversation going throughout the day with the Lord in prayer? Are we praying? Will somebody ever be able to say of you, you'll find them praying? I remember that growing up. I knew when it was not time to mess with my grandmother, right? My grandmother was an open book to us. She always cared. She got up in the morning. She cooked breakfast. As soon as breakfast was over, she'd start cooking lunch. That was a great grandmother. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But there were times when we couldn't find her. We needed something to ask, and my granddaddy would say, she's praying. What a testimony for those of us who are believers. Will the Lord find us praying? Will someone find us praying? Second is baptism, and I'm going to hurry here. We have noted this when we saw the conversion of the eunuch just a few chapters ago. But as soon as Ananias comes and he prays with Saul and the scales fall off, it tells us he rose and was baptized in verse 18. He rose and was baptized. And what does this mean for us? Baptism, as we said, is that public profession of faith, that testimony of the fact that we have converted, we've changed, we trusted in Christ with our life. A forgiveness of sins has been met in Jesus. Jesus, and we are united with him. Death, burial, and resurrection, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's what baptism testifies to the world. But it also, as we see, it also shows that not only are we identifying ourselves with Christ as death, burial, and resurrection, but we're coming up to follow him in obedience. That's why we testify even here. What is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. And when we claim Jesus is Lord, we are saying he's the Lord of my life. In other words, I will follow him. It becomes that testimony. So here in this picture, baptism is not only the clear profession that Saul has been changed, identifying himself with Christ, it also becomes the clear statement that he no longer lives for himself, but Christ Jesus, and he will follow after him. And even as Jesus tells him, 
This guy, I got a plan for him. Gentiles and kings and Jews, he'll go to them. It's not going to be easy. He's going to be met with trouble, as verse 16 says. But no matter what, what Saul is saying through his baptism is this statement, not just new life in Christ, but also wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he takes me, I'll follow. Third, not only he has the prayer and the obedience to follow through baptism in his life, we see third, fellowship with the believers. Chapter 19, the second half there, for some days he was with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately Saul was welcomed, uh, vouchsafed by this, this Ananias fellow, brought into the church there that had been raised up through the gospel proclamation in Damascus, and he was welcomed into their fellowship. And Saul needed them in his walk. This community of faith, the excitement as he began to figure things out. Could you imagine the stories as later Saul, uh, known as Paul, would go into even Rome and appeal to even Agrippa? And even then, I'm sure there were some people back in Damascus and say, I remember when that joker first showed up to church. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I remember when he figured out that it's not about the temple anymore, that Jesus is where we meet God. I remember when he figured out that, that he's our prophet and our priest and our king. I remember when he understood what it meant for Jesus to become the son of God and come and die in our place. I remember seeing the excitement on old Saul's face. I still call him Saul. I knew him as Saul back then. I remember his excitement on his face as he came to new life. And so it is for us as we welcome in new believers how exciting it is for us to see it on their face. To enjoy that together. But not only does Saul come in, Saul immediately takes the Great Commission seriously. He is a disciple joining together with other disciples to make more disciples. For it tells us there in verse 23 as they're coming after him, or verse 25, but his disciples took him by night. Saul had not only come in and welcomed into the church, he began to proclaim, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and by proclaiming the truth, others began to believe, and he began to lead them in faith and teach them and say, follow me, for I'm following Christ. He was a disciple making disciples. That's what we desire to be as our church. We join together as disciples to make more disciples. That's what the Great Commission tells us. But then finally, he proclaimed Jesus. Verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the son of God. Immediately it says, this guy goes from breathing threats to proclaiming Jesus. In a matter of moments, simply because everything has changed when he's met the risen Savior face to face. There's no doubting anymore. There's no question anymore. He has seen the Savior. He knows the truth. He has had his sins forgiven. The scales have fallen off his eyes. Now he sees with the eyes of his heart to know the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The darkness has been removed. The light has come. And he has nothing else to do but proclaim it. How can you hold that in? How can he keep that to himself? Preaching the word is what he begins to do. Immediately, it says. And surely, just as he opposed it before, he is met with opposition. Even the apostles struggled. Even the Hellenists tried to kill him. Even those in Damascus wanted him dead, watching the gate day and night. But immediately, that did not stop Saul. He preached the gospel in the face of every opposition. And what causes you to preach the gospel in the face of opposition? Nothing more than meeting Jesus Christ face to face. When you know him and know the power of his name, been arrested by his grace, then you know there is no name greater than his. You know that whatever threats you used to breathe out against Christians were futile and useless. It's like he says, I was kicking against the goads, like kicking rocks. It makes no sense. It's futile and useless because this one is the Christ. So come at me if you will, Saul says. Don't accept me if you will, but I will not stop preaching. How discouraging it may have been for the apostles not to accept him, but he will not stop preaching. He will not stop proclaiming. He didn't stop preaching from the moment of his conversion to the day he died. He had a story to tell, as do all of us. By the way, the scriptures, this is not unique. 
The scriptures speak or give plenty examples of this. How people come to faith and immediately they proclaim the gospel. The woman at the well immediately goes into Samaria and brings her whole village to her. Or the man born blind from birth outside it is, is, is made to see again and immediately he goes into the temple and he proclaims this one who has changed his life and they kept asking him all the questions. And what was his statement? I don't know about all your questions. I don't know about all that. What I do know is I once was blind and now I see. And what you cannot change is this experience of the gospel in our hearts and lives that take us from death to life. And when we have that, we cannot hold that in. We proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. We say He's the Christ. And you cannot confound Christ, but you can be confounded, as it says, because Paul, Saul, right there was a testimony. There was a testimony. The church that is healthy, the church that is at peace, the church that is built up, as this says, is a church full of disciples ready to welcome and make new disciples. Men and women arrested by God's grace, steadfast in prayer, faithful in obedience to follow God's word, joyously meeting together and seeking to proclaim Jesus. That's what the New Testament church looks like. And it is my prayer that that's what we look like. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful because I see so many signs of this in our church here. While we are not perfect, surely, may we be striving to be a church just like this where each one of us welcome and encourage one another, strengthen one another, and we all spend our lives in prayer, spend our time following after Jesus, gathering together as the body and proclaiming His name. And may it be said of us, just like it says here at the end of 31, it multiplied. It multiplied. May that be the same for us. Today, there's a next step for each and every one of you. Some of you may be lost and, and haven't trusted Christ, but you, you've seen Him and you know Him and, and His grace is great and you recognize you're a sinner and today you need to trust Christ for the first time. Just as Saul was on the road to Damascus, the Lord has arrested you. It may not have been instantaneous like this, but over the last few months, you have seen his gospel. You have heard these things and you are slowly not able to refute them or run from them anymore. He's becoming more and more real for you in your life. And today, you need to say, he is Lord. He's Lord. Maybe today, some of you need to follow him in obedience of baptism. Say, I, I belong to Christ. You've trusted Christ for some time, but you haven't made it publicly known. And today you want to make that publicly known that, that I am his and he is mine. And I want to follow after him. Follow after him in my life. He's my Lord. Some of you today, maybe it'd be membership of joining here with this body to join together with us so that we can together make disciples who make disciples love and encourage one another. You need love and encouragement in your life and it's here, it's the church, hopefully by God's grace that you find those things. We are not meant to be lone rangers in this world, but to be together, walking on this journey of faith. Every one of us have these steps. Some of you, you just need to commit yourself to prayer. God's word fellowship with the saints and proclaiming his name. What would it be for you today? Let's pray together. Father, help us by your grace to follow after you. You are kind and you are good. God, help us. Even now, work in hearts to see the next step for every one of us in this place.